The term hyperlink was coined in the mid-1960s by the technologist Ted Nelson, who also came up with, among other terms, intertwingularity, which refers to the connectedness and interrelationships found between all types of knowledge, and teledildonics, which refers to virtual sex, in which both or all parties have devices that the other or others control remotely. So yeah, he's a colorful character. But he's also the developer of Project Xanadu, an alternative to the World Wide Web that never quite got off the ground, but which is still in development today. And you can actually find a working version of something approximating what he had in mind through a modern iteration of the project called Open Xanadu. The overall concept of Xanadu, though, was predicated on creating a sort of everlasting archive, a digital repository for all the world's information and published works, so that these documents, these words, and the knowledge they encode could be accessed and discovered by anyone who wanted them from anywhere. He wanted this archival system to allow creators to build different versions of their documents, to have forks and branches of the document, which end differently, or which are aimed at sharing the same information with different audiences. And he wanted non-sequential writing to be possible to provide a kind of choose-your-own-adventure capability for any type of document. To enable that latter possibility, it was necessary to come up with novel technologies and concepts that allowed users to navigate texts non-sequentially, something that didn't exist at the time, it being the 1960s, and the word processor, not to mention modern computers, not existing yet. But in the mid-70s, Nelson published his ideas about these concepts in a non-sequential publication called Computer Lib slash Dream Machines, followed by a 1981 work called Literary Machines, where he discussed how computer technologies might be used to assist artists in creating new types of work. Nelson and his associates worked on Xanadu throughout the 1970s, but he ran out of money leading into the 80s, so a practical version of the concept didn't come to fruition, though he did, in the mid-70s, refine his concept of what he wanted this interconnected archival writing system to be, with the term DocuVerse, a globally distributed electronic library of interconnected documents, what you might call a meta-document, that was accessible but also stored and supported around the planet, giving folks around the world the ability to read what was on it, but also to add to it without having to go anywhere. It would be accessible from wherever they happened to be. In the mid-80s, Nelson's project was bolstered by monetary support from the founder of the software company, Autodesk, who he'd met at a hacker conference, and that allowed him to eventually produce an imperfect but working model of the Xanadu system. But a fracture in the group, a schism predicated on what programming language they would write Xanadu in, led to an inability to meet deadlines set by Autodesk, and the company divested from the project in 1992. Around this same time, a rival system that aimed to accomplish similar things, the World Wide Web, was being developed by Tim Berners-Lee, a man who was working at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, and who was trying to solve inefficiency problems he discovered in the organization, resulting from fairly vital info being stored in different computers, practically inaccessible by any one person at any one time. This catalyzed the development of what he called a web between these computers, serving as an information management system that would utilize addresses for each of these computers on the network, and from there each document on each computer would also have an address. This would allow a user on one computer to navigate from their terminal to a computer elsewhere, opening up files from their remote location accessing them, and thus alleviating the distance and distribution issues that were leading to so many information-related problems at CERN. The concept of hypertext, which Berners-Lee has said originated in the 1950s, and which was the concept Nelson was ostensibly riffing on when he coined the term hyperlink, was used to describe the text-based components of this web that Berners-Lee was building, and he decided to call non-text objects within this space hypermedia. Existing projects, like a publishing tool called Dynatext, made the production of this web a little bit easier than it would have been otherwise, 
as they could borrow useful user interface concepts from that existing project. But the first version of the hypertext project that they proposed and got permission to build, which was at the time called World Wide Web, was completed by Christmas of 1990, at which point Berners-Lee had the first working web browser, which was also called World Wide Web, and which also served as a web editor for building things on the web, the first website, which was just a description of the project, and the first web server, which was hosted on a Next computer, the computer company founded by Apple co-founder Steve Jobs when he was booted from his own company back in the day before rejoining Apple later. That first browser, though, was the portal through which the web could be accessed. And with time, such software has only become more complex, but also, in some ways, more invisible to those who utilize modern versions of it. What I'd like to talk about today is the web browser, what's happened in this space since the advent of the web, and where information perusal using such software might be going next. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. Patrons receive an additional episode of the show each month, and it's also a wonderful way to help support the continued production of this show. This is a one-person operation, and such patronage is the reason I'm able to contribute the time that I do to this project each week. A huge thanks to everybody who is already contributing in some way, shape, or form, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. And if you're enjoying Let's Know Things, you might also enjoy my weekly news analysis column. You can subscribe to that at understandery.com. All right, let's get back to the show. In March of 1991, that first web browser made by Tim Berners-Lee was opened up for his colleagues at CERN to use. And by May of that same year, a math student intern at CERN named Nicola Pello had written the Line Mode Browser, the second-ever web browser, to be used cross-platform, allowing web pages on the network to be displayed on older terminals, access points that were plugged into computers, and that could be used as if they were computers, but which were not themselves computers. In 1992, a slew of World Wide Web-based browser offspring were developed by myriad different people, including Midas WWW, Viola WWW, Lynx, Erwise, and Cello, all of which added something new to the mix, including support for PostScript files, the ability to utilize browser-based systems on other platforms, and the introduction of graphical user interfaces. The popularity of the web, though, which was the parlance that had been adopted for the World Wide Web distributed hypertext network that browsers of all kinds allowed users to access. The World Wide Web browser was eventually renamed Nexus to avoid confusion between the two, by the way. The popularity of that larger web network was amplified with the release of NCSA Mosaic, often just called Mosaic, which was thus named because of its support for a variety of internet protocols including File Transfer Protocol, Network News Transfer Protocol, and Gopher, which was important because each of these systems specialized in something different. And this one browser allowed users to utilize all of them, all in one place. Mosaic was also focused on being intuitive and visual. It was something a normal, non-programmer human being could use. And when it was ported over to Microsoft's still relatively new Windows operating system, alongside Apple's, also quite new, Macintosh platform. It really took hold with the average person who wanted to log in for the first time and see what this World Wide Web thing was all about. Mosaic enjoyed about two years at the top, from 1993 until 1995. In the years between, though, the leader of the Mosaic team at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, the NCSA, which was the organization that developed Mosaic, left to create the Netscape Communications Corporation, through which he released Netscape Navigator, a competing browser, in late 1994. Also in 94, IBM released a browser called Web Explorer, 
and leading into 1995, a browser capable of handling all of HTML3's features. HTML being the display language of the web, which determines what people see in their browsers, and HTML3 being an upgrade to the standards and the capabilities of that language. This new browser, UDWWW, was capable of showing all of HTML3's capabilities, pulling ahead of the pack very briefly before Microsoft with its new Internet Explorer browser, which it had purchased from another software company, Spyglass Incorporated, entered the browser market. In 1996, Netscape, with its Navigator software, owned that browser market with a market reach of 86%. So 86% of web users used Navigator. That same year, Microsoft's new entry, which had only been released in August the previous year, had already claimed 10% of the market. And in 96, Microsoft began bundling their Internet Explorer browser with their Windows operating system. Meaning, if you had Windows on your computer, you would also automatically have Internet Explorer on your computer, right out of the box. And especially for people who had no experience with the web, this was revelatory. They already had a browser, so they could click around and get started right away. Very little foreknowledge of what the web was or why they should want it was necessary. But this also meant that people would just start using Internet Explorer, never knowing there were other options, maybe. This change in tactics fundamentally shifted the browser playing field and changed the way people used the web. It's also considered to be the opening salvo of what later became known as the first browser war. Before I get into that, though, the article I'd like to unspool today comes from Fast Company, and it's entitled Firefox at 15, Its Rise, Fall, and Privacy First Renaissance. This piece focuses on the evolution and recent shift in posture by one entity in the browser space, Mozilla Firefox and it especially addresses the change in approach by Mozilla toward user privacy, something that hasn't always been a primary focus for them or any other browser maker, but which they seem to be uniquely positioned to adopt as a brand-defining feature today. Let's step back to the first browser war, though, to see how we arrived where we are right now before addressing the current browser landscape, what its shape means for the web-perusing public and what might happen next. Arguably, the very first browser wars were actually fought during the mosaic age of the web browser, when new variations on the theme were popping up on a monthly basis, created by individuals and organizations around the world, each adding something new to the conversation, innovating like crazy, but many of them based on that core popular mosaic model and software. Quite a few of these entrants actually just licensed Mosaic to build their own browsers atop it, to get their own browsers started, including Spyglass, which was eventually bought by Microsoft to make Internet Explorer. But notably, Spyglass never used Mosaic's source code. They just wanted to be able to use Mosaic's technology and trademarks during the production process of their own new thing. The result of this proto-conflict was Netscape's emergence from the fray as the dominant player of this space. And though many of these other browsers continued for a long time, and some still exist today in some shape or another, the Navigator software was the bee's knees in the consumer-grade browser space until about 1995, when, as I mentioned a few moments ago, Microsoft released its Internet Explorer browser and started to gobble up market share, that gobbling reaching impressive speed in 1996, when they began to install IE by default on all Windows computers. That pre-installation was the spark that led to a browser brand conflagration. Navigator was still by far the most popular software in this space, but Microsoft was competing vigorously, releasing Internet Explorer 2.0 as a free download for all Windows users, leading other browser companies to make their own products free as well in order to stay relevant, and leading to a bundling race where Netscape, with their new communicator upgrade, alongside pretty much every other browser company imaginable, started making deals to provide their browser with other bits of software people might buy, or to package them with other free software that would then be handed out or shipped to people who were interested. Netscape Communicator and Microsoft's IE were iterated at a very rapid clip over the next few years. New proprietary HTML tags were added during this time, meaning 
tags that you could use to do special nifty things on websites, but which would only show up on either Netscape or Microsoft browsers. And new scripting languages like Netscape's JavaScript were developed. Initially, Netscape had a first mover advantage over Microsoft, but by the end of 1996, with the release of IE 3.0, Microsoft had matched Netscape's offerings, and in late 1997, IE 4.0 was released. On that day, Netscape's lead had decreased from owning 86% of the market to 72% of the market, and Microsoft's market share had increased from 10% to 18%. And you may notice that those numbers leave very little room for other players, which had mostly been elbowed out of the market by this point, except for a few small niche cases. The later stages of the first browser war were primarily defined by IE superseding Netscape's offerings, despite the World Wide Web Consortium stepping in to try to ensure that all browsers had shared standards so that any website could be viewed on any browser, rather than there being a bunch of proprietary features that would only show up on one or the other. This was especially necessary in 1997 because at that point, the partisanship between IE and Netscape users was fairly significant, with many websites bearing a little piece of text somewhere on the front page, saying, best viewed in Internet Explorer, or best viewed on Netscape, alongside a little logo for one or the other, which a user could then click to download the website developer's preferred browser. By 1998, though, when Microsoft was facing an antitrust case from the United States government, the writing was on the wall. IE was becoming the new dominant browser, and Netscape was acquired by America Online, for $4.2 billion. Netscape was absorbed into AOL's walled garden model of the internet, and that left Internet Explorer with no serious competition. By 2002, 96% of web users were using IE as their browser. As often happens in these sorts of cases, where one entity gains true or de facto monopolization of a particular industry or aspect of an industry, Internet Explorer then ceased to innovate for years. They had no one to compete against, and thus they had very little incentive to invest in this browser software that much of the public had no choice but to use, no matter how dusty and old and not great it became. There were a few minor upgrades between 2001 and 2004, but nothing remarkable, and these updates were released at nothing like the speed with which Microsoft was moving during that conflict with Netscape. But then, in 2004, things began to change again, and fairly rapidly. When Netscape's Navigator software began to decline, they open-sourced the browser's code, opening it up and making it available for other people to riff upon, so they could build their own whatevers, not having to start from scratch to do so. In 1998, Netscape had created a side project called the Mozilla Organization to help develop the Mozilla application suite a piece of software based on Netscape Communicator that was meant to do everything internet-related within one easy-to-use package. So you could browse the web, but also read and send email, use news groups, which were kind of like internet forums, and use IRC chat clients, which were kind of like WhatsApp, but in your browser. AOL began to lose interest in that side of internetery, though, and the Mozilla Foundation was founded mid-2003 to make sure that, even lacking Netscape, which was now part of AOL, the Mozilla Foundation could still function and focus on the open source side of what they were building. AOL provided them with an initial injection of money, some hardware, some intellectual property, and three employees for three months to get them started. And this newly empowered nonprofit recalibrated its efforts to build a community driven descendant for Netscape, handing off the larger suite of software to a new entity called SeaMonkey which still exists as an open source project today, by the way, to focus on just the browser. What they came up with, after several years of work, was a stripped-down browser concept called, first, Phoenix. But then, because of trademark issues with a company called Phoenix Technologies, Firebird, which led to its own set of issues with the makers of a database software project also called Firebird. Eventually, in early 2004, Mozilla Firebird was reborn as Mozilla Firefox, a name that is said to be derived from a casual nickname, sometimes applied to the Red Panda, an animal which became the mascot of the newly released browser. Later that same year, in November 2004, version 1.0 of the browser was released, 
and this came shortly after Microsoft announced that Internet Explorer would no longer be independent and downloadable by whomever wanted it. All future versions would require the installation of Windows Vista, a newfangled version of the Windows operating system that Microsoft was vehemently flogging and which was now an expensive prerequisite for the use of future versions of Internet Explorer. That announcement led to a joint effort between the Mozilla Foundation and Opera Software, a now publicly traded Norwegian-founded software company that at the time was a very small player on the browser market known for being simple but relatively feature-rich and innovative. Opera and Mozilla began working together in 2004 to build new open technology browser standards. At the beginning of that same year, Microsoft's Internet Explorer had 94.8% of the browser market, but by the end of the year, that had dropped to 88.9%. By the end of 2005, it had dropped further to 85.45%, and it continued to drop slowly but steadily over the course of the next several years. These were the early days of the Second Browser War, a period that lasted, by some estimations anyway, from about 2004 until 2017. This stage of the conflict between browser-based entities began with the dominance of Internet Explorer in a space that wasn't innovating. The Mozilla Opera Alliance forced Microsoft's hand a little bit, resulting in more updates than there likely would have been otherwise, lacking that outside competition that was doing new stuff, making IE look antiquated in comparison. But it still wasn't a dramatically accelerated moment, just a little less sluggish than the prior few years. Coming into 2006, Opera had shown itself to be a rugged, versatile, and minimalistic browser, useful especially on smaller devices where space and processing power were at a premium. Mozilla's Firefox had continued to evolve, deploying a lot of clever gimmicks, like tabbed browsing, a search bar, a phishing filter, and a slew of upgraded web standards developed alongside Opera. But Internet Explorer swooped in with version 7 of their browser and closed the feature gap for the moment. In 2007, Microsoft announced they would no longer be supporting Internet Explorer on the Mac operating system, and Apple doubled down on their Safari browser that they had built into their operating system, much like IE was built into Windows, but which hadn't been a huge priority for Apple in the preceding years. Apple gained new prominence in the browser space, though, when they released the first iPhone, introducing iOS, and shortly thereafter, making massive waves by declaring that Flash was not good for mobile devices, and as a result, they would no longer be supporting it. This came at a time, importantly, when HTML5 and CSS3, standards for laying out websites and styling websites, respectively, were being prepared for rollout. And these new standards allowed website developers to do many of the same things that previously required Flash, which was a very dominant multimedia format that allowed developers to do all kinds of cool things, like embed animations and sound and video and games into websites. But many of those features would soon be replicatable latently within HTML, rather than requiring the embedding of a large separate media file that would then have to be downloaded. So Apple took that unpopular stand and began to focus their attention on a post-Flash internet. And though not everyone fell into lockstep immediately, after a year or two, Steve Jobs was proven right. Or he created a situation in which he would have to be right due to the prominence of the iPhone in the smartphone market. And Flash was backburnered on most browsers, while native features became the preferred method of displaying such media going forward. This conflict really swung into full gear, though, as a consequence of Google entering the browser market with its Chrome browser for Windows. In 2008, the first version of Chrome hit the market alongside open-sourced versions called Chromium for Windows, Mac, and Linux machines. By the end of 2009, Chrome had gained a 3.6% browser market share. By late 2010, IE fell below 50% market share for the first time to 49.87% and Google Chrome 9 was released at the beginning of 2011, followed in quick succession by seven new versions of the browser that same year. Chrome reportedly passed Firefox to become the second most used browser in the world in late 2011, and by mid-2012, by some measurements, Chrome had very narrowly come out on top, 
bypassing Internet Explorer as the most used browser in the world. Though interestingly, IE was still the most used browser in the world on weekdays for months after that tipping point. So it's thought that although more people were installing Chrome on their own devices at home, IE was still the most used at work due to Microsoft's prominence within the corporate world. After seeing the benefits of the type of rapid release schedule practiced by Google in their iteration of the Chrome browser, Mozilla decided to start doing the same, knocking out four whole number versions of the browser in 2011. This gave them a bump, but Safari was climbing too, powered in part by their browser's out-of-the-box availability on iPhones and Mac computers, and in part because they'd mostly caught up with the other browsers on the market in terms of features and functionality at this point. Just as Apple benefited from Safari installations on iPhones, which a lot of people started using after they were first released in 2007, Chrome benefited immensely from the ever-increasing popularity of Android devices, which were far more ubiquitous than iPhones, and most of which came with Chrome installed right out of the box, giving them that same leg up in terms of mainstream adoption by non-techies that IE enjoyed back in the day with the Windows PC, and that Apple was enjoying on a somewhat smaller and more specialized scale with the iPhone. Chrome also benefited from its rapid iteration, though, and the vast amount of resources that Google could afford to throw at it. The company's business model is to keep people online so they can display more ads to those people. So controlling the space in which that browsing takes place is a big priority. So they invested heavily, invested a lot of human power and money into the problem, and emerged with a very fast, comparably quite flexible rendering engine, which is the main software component of the web browser, which converts HTML into web pages that can be viewed and interacted with by the user. And that rendering engine was called Chromium, which you may recall was the name of the open source core of the Chrome browser that Google released in the browser's early days. So it could be used by others to build their own riff on what Google was building using a fairly sturdy and powerful core. Notably, Microsoft is currently building themselves a new browser to replace Edge, which itself replaced Internet Explorer. And that newest browser that hasn't been released as of the day I'm recording this will be based on Chromium. Chrome won this second browser war by taking the lead in 2012 and then reinforcing its dominance year by year. As of the day I'm recording this, in mid-November 2019, some of the best stat aggregations indicate that Chrome is still way ahead of all other browsers across all devices, with a 64.92% usage share which is about four times that of Safari, which comes in second place at 15.97%. Firefox comes in at a distant third with 4.33% of all browser usage, followed by Samsung Internet UC Browser, which is owned by the Alibaba Group in China, Opera Edge, which is Microsoft's replacement for Internet Explorer, and then Internet Explorer dead last of the top eight. Though the others category, the combination of all of those that are not in the top eight, adds up to more usage than either Edge or IE these days. 2.8% for all of the others in aggregate, 2.05% for Edge, and 1.98% for IE, which is actually kind of impressive, IE being so old and antiquated and retired at this point. It's important to note that, first, there are many different ways to measure browser usage, and all of them are imperfect. The numbers I just listed are from a few different sources that themselves aggregate from a few different sources, but they're different from those shown on other sources that do the same, so take those numbers with a grain of salt. That said, the general positioning in terms of who's in which place, first, second, third, and by how much, isn't really in dispute here. There are periods during which there is a changeover, and it's up for debate when one browser finally bypassed another, which specific date that happened on. But the difference tends to be measured in weeks or months, not years, between these different measurement systems. And once one has taken prominence, or grabbed and held second place for a while, that tends to be the case for a fair bit, until something fundamental changes. Right now, there does seem to be a change of some kind happening, though there's a chance that it's more hype than actual action. We can't say for sure quite yet. What seems to be happening, though, 
is that users and some businesses, some industries, not to mention some government officials, are pushing back hard against the traditional ways of doing things on the internet. And that includes the saturation of advertising and the prominence of invasive data gathering that allows advertisers to better target us, allowing them to sell their ads for higher prices. This is a dynamic that's being addressed in many different ways by many different entities. There are proposed regulations, there are petitions and boycotts, there are criminal investigations and fines and legislations, some fairly universal, some more regional, impacting some places more than others, but because of the nature of the online world, most are impacting everyone to some degree, even if they're catalyzed by adjustments to some ultra-specific local law. Looping back around to that Peace and Fast company, Firefox has been getting a lot of praise of late for moves that they are making to place their browser squarely in the camp of those wanting to rewire the web completely, giving far more power to users at the expense of advertisers and at the expense of platforms that rely upon advertisements to pay the bills. And in turn, they've revitalized their brand in the eyes of a great many, while casting themselves as dangerous radicals in the eyes of others. I've seen several pieces recently about the third browser war that we are either about to undertake or that we're maybe already in the midst of without being fully cognizant of it. Maybe we're experiencing that quiet moment as all the participants are lining up their artillery on the hill, preparing to fire, but nobody's really taken a shot yet. Some browsers have latent advantages in this potential impending conflict. Chrome is the default browser of Android phones, while Safari is the default on iPhones, of course, but even Opera, which is still in operation, making up a very small portion of the market, but building increasingly specialized, often quite tiny and simple browsers for use on everything from feature phones to portable game consoles. They're doing quite well on those specific types of devices, in developing markets, and even on some types of feature phone, which is increasingly important in some parts of the world right now. Firefox, though, is in a position where they don't have their own hardware, and they are not specialized enough in any particular direction to become the go-to Game Boy browser, for instance. They're considered to be on par with, or better than, both Chrome and Safari in most regards. But that is all they've really had going for them until just recently. They're not made by a big multinational corporation, and thus the resources and incentives have not been in place to invest in any big marketing push or other means of standing out in the browser landscape. They've been pretty good, but pretty good is not good enough to get most people to switch from the status quo default browser that they have as a consequence of buying a particular device. That has been changing, though, as Firefox has become more vocal about their focus on user empowerment. And they've been doing this as awareness has grown about Google's tracking of people all around the internet, about the pervasiveness of ads on the web in general, but also about some of Chrome's ostensibly abusive practices, some of which have led to comparisons with Internet Explorer 6, back in the day when Microsoft was all about the dirty tricks to maintain their lead over everyone else. A program manager from Mozilla accused Google of intentionally slowing down YouTube on Firefox browsers back in mid-2018, and in early 2019, a former general manager and vice president at Mozilla spoke out about how Google was stacking the deck in their search results to keep people from downloading Firefox, how Gmail and Google Docs would demonstrate selective performance issues in Firefox, and how demonstration sites would falsely block people using the Firefox browser, calling it incompatible. It's notable, I think, that Firefox is already the second most used browser on computers, as opposed to smartphones and tablets, where Chrome and Safari take the lead. So Firefox has slowly crept back up to outpace Safari on laptops and such over these last few years already. It's also notable to consider how this change in stance by Mozilla at this moment in particular might shift those popularity tides even further, as more abuses by dominant players in this space, in tech-related spaces in general, create a potential surge in interest in devices and software that are not tracking us, that don't have toxic incentives or hidden agendas, that are not the anti-competitive pre-installed defaults forced down our throats by over-aggressive hardware corporations. Of course, there are several other substantially smaller, but also relatively baggage-free options available these days. Opera is still going strong in its many shapes and sizes, and browsers like Brave are experimenting with novel forms of supporting online content. 
doing away with advertising potentially, but in some cases giving users the option to turn advertising back on selectively and then earning credits that they can give to the sites that they visit. And those credits that they earn can then be exchanged by those websites with Brave for a share of the advertising revenue that was earned by, that was earned by displaying them. One of the biggest pros and cons of this moment in the current browser conflict, though, is that a huge majority of all available browsers are based on just one core rendering engine, Chromium. There's Chromium itself, Chrome, Microsoft's upcoming default web browser, Opera, Vivaldi, the Brave browser that I just mentioned, Blisk, Colibri, Epic, Iron, Amazon Silk, Samsung's browser, the Avast Secure browser, all of them, and many more are based on the same core software. Which isn't terrible, in a way, because that central software, Chromium, is quite powerful and stable. We could certainly do far worse, and having those fundamentals in place and available for free, open source, means that browser makers can focus on other things, like Brave with their novel approach to advertising and funding creators, and Amazon with their experimentation in building a browser that is unabashedly super Amazon-centric. The flip side of that, though, is that if the majority of players are built atop the same skeleton, it's difficult to build or even imagine building something that does not fit within that general shape. Building a rendering engine is no small task, and there's a good chance that most of these browsers would not exist without having had access to that core technology. But there's also a good chance that we would have more diversity within this space if more makers were starting fresh rather than building atop something that already exists, and that is already so common and dominant. This is one more space where Firefox stands out, by the way. It uses an engine called Quantum, which it developed in-house, and which, based on speed tests done mid-2019, earned it the highest browser rating, marking it as faster performing than Chromium-based browsers, including Chrome, for some tasks at least. Now, it's impossible to say for how long that will be the case, and whether that's universal, I seriously doubt it. With any kind of computing task, there is immense variation between different use cases, different hardware, things of that nature. It's also important to note that most of the tech used for computer and smartphone browsers don't work as well on older devices and feature phones, which are, as I mentioned before, vital for expansion into developing markets. Some of these browsers are competing there with stripped down versions of what they offer elsewhere, and in those cases, simpler browsers like Opera have a bit of an advantage. But of the bigger browsers, Firefox does seem to have a slight leg up over Google, despite Chrome's best efforts to own that space through its feature phone-based Android variants. But based on Chromium or otherwise, the variety of browsers available today and the different stances that they're taking on different issues, the different ideologies upon which they're premised, does seem to indicate that Chrome's approach is not the only player in town, and that we could be on the cusp of another interesting, relatively more active period of innovation and conflict within this space, for better and for worse. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here on Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter of the show. You can do so at patreon.com slash let's know things, or you can go to let's know things.com and find a list of other options, other ways that you can help support the show financially or non-financially. Leaving a review, for instance, or sharing the show with a friend or your social network of choice are all ways to help support the show and are all very much appreciated. A huge thanks to everybody who's helping to support the show in some way, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to Protect Predators by Ronan Farrow. There was a whole lot of hype around this book before it came out, probably with good reason, but at its most essential level. This is just a behind-the-scenes look at what the investigation process looks like when you're going after a powerful person who's done horrible things, and when you yourself are perhaps a somewhat visible person to begin with, as is the case with the author. And those ingredients, it turns out, makes for a pretty compelling story. It's very well written. The audiobook version is somewhat interesting. I listened to the audiobook, and the author reads it and does a whole lot of accents and voices, which is at times a little bit weird and annoying and at times laugh-out-loud hilarious. 
But regardless of the format, the story itself is quite good, and it is a really excellent look at what goes into this type of reporting, which I think is an underappreciated aspect of journalism. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. If you're into what I'm doing here on the podcast, you'll probably also enjoy my weekly news analysis column. You can subscribe to receive that in your inbox each week for free at understandery.com. And if you're keen to say howdy, please feel free to reach out and do so on your social network of choice. I am at Colin is my name on most of those. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.